I do want to um, discuss your new novel, partly because I read it recently and I found it so immersive and moving. By the end of it, I felt like I was part of the McLaren clan. And oh, it's, it's such a beautiful and honest and heart-wrenching depiction of family. But I, but I also want to discuss it because, um, as it's turned out, um, to be so much more of a topical novel about what's happening in America at the moment with widespread protests and the continuing Black Lives Matter movement. And although it's only just been published now, um, I know you said you actually wrote this uh, a few years ago. Um, so what inspired you to center this novel around a scene of police brutality that ultimately results in the death of an innocent man and the severe trauma to another man? Well, probably like most of my long novels, there are a number of uh, like tributaries that flow into this the stream or river. So probably there are, it's, it's overdetermined. And the, the, the germ of the novel is my first husband died and after a while I met another man. I wanted to write about the transition of grief. Grief never really goes away, but so grief gets modified and, and you sort of change. I wanted to write about the phenomenon of natural evolving of grief into something else but i wanted to write about it in a in a in a kind of plenary plenteous way rather than writing about it as a memoir about what focusing on one person i wanted to write about grief in a family so the whole family in a sense moves on and virgil the young the son who'd been a difficult like a thorn in the side of his father he never had a real job the father was always exasperated by him, and he's an annoying person uh, if he were in your family. You might admire him if you didn't know him too well. But mm -hmm. Virgil, to me, is a very distinctive personality. But he basically had always been gay, and he just sort of always suppressed that knowledge of an interest in, in, men, in men, you know. Mm -hmm. And after his father dies, he allows himself to acknowledge that his love is really for another for a man you know so so virgil deals with grief by becoming a larger person and mm. each one of the characters works through grief by discovering some other part of their personality that maybe they didn't know was there or maybe it was just suppressed mm. but jocelyn had always been so such a devoted wife and totally totally a wife to her husband and she adored him mm. and he adored her they had a really wonderful marriage sort of complement of opposites so it would never have occurred to her ever that she could fall in love with somebody else let alone get married again and it's not anything that she would ever ever have thought so she's left behind in this big house and yet she winds up in the Galapagos she's out <laughs> she's in a She's in the ocean, mm. you know, she's in the ocean at the very end of the novel. She's so far from home. She's thousands, thousands of miles from home. And all her, everything about her life is sort of turned inside out. Mm. So some of that happened to me, so I, I wanted to write about that. Mm -hmm. But then one of the chapters in the novel, which nobody would know about, is when the youngest daughter, is driving her car on a road not too far from here. And this unmarked car comes right up behind her. It turns out to be a police officer. So that happened to me uh. not long after Ray died, my first husband. Hmm. I was just driving on a country road and I, I, I never drive fast. If I'm driving probably below the speed limit. So this unmarked, this car, I thought it was just a regular car came right up behind me and I thought he was going to hit my bumper mm. and I was really frightened because it was sort of a lonely road so I started to go a little faster and he followed me and so finally I was probably going 40 miles an hour and then he puts on a siren turned out to be a police officer and I he was all alone and I was all alone and I was I was really frightened of this person mm. He said, you were going over the speed limit. And I said, well, I, 
I thought you wanted me to go faster or you were going to hit me or something. Mm. Everything I said to him was very feeble and faltering. I mean, I'm not an arrogant person. I was so frightened of this encounter. I wanted to write about police officers in the United States mm. who are almost like rogue criminals in a way. They can, they can almost do anything they want to to a person in this country right now. It's not, I mean, no, it's not the case in other countries around the world. Right now, there's something called qualified immunity that police officers have. They can just basically shoot you, and then they could say that, they, that, you, made a, that you lunged for their gun. Mm -hmm. You tried to get their gun away from them, so they shot you dead. And if there's nobody there to witness it, it they get away with it. Mm -hmm. So the whole resistance now about the terrible torture death of George Floyd is that it was on video mm -hmm. and we all saw what really happened. Mm -hmm. if, if there was no video, the police officer would have said that George Floyd tried to get his gun and he had to kill him. You know, That's exactly what they always say. He was afraid of his life and this was a danger and so forth. But we see the video. However, when I was on that country road all alone, there was no video. Mm. And when Whitey McLaren is tasered by these police officers at the side of the road, there's no video. Mm -hmm. So I basically wanted to write about this terrifying problem that we have in the United States, which is doubled and trebled or quadrupled if you're black. Yeah. I mean, I was a white woman. And I was in a nice car, a Honda, a new car. So he was terrorizing me. Mm. And he ultimately did give me a ticket. You know, but if I had been younger or a black woman, mm. he could have sexually mis molested me or, I mean, he could have killed me. Mm. There's so many things that I felt could have happened. And you know, as a white woman in her 60s, he sort of, you know, maybe took pity on me because I was so, so docile. But anyway, I do want to write about that. So that's the beginning of the novel and how this act of, of naive bravery on the part of a white man of 60, whatever he is, really stand up to these two young policemen. Mm. So that precipitates the tragedy of the novel. And you've, you've written about um, racism from many different perspectives, like, like your novel Them um, um, depicts the, the events in 1967 in Detroit when uh, the Black community rose up to protest against the racist actions of the city police department. Um, but it, you've also written in your novel The Sacrifice, um, which depicts an incident where a police officer is falsely accused of a, of a racist attack. So. Um, what, what do you find are the challenges of chronicling such a complex and important issue um, in fiction? Well, again, it really depends on the work. When I was writing them, I had lived through the Detroit riot, as it's called. Mm. I had lived through that with my with husband, Ray. So I always wanted to provide a context for the riot. So I went back in time a couple of generations and then worked to the, what is essentially a family novel for the riot. And in the novel, the riot is not that unexpected. There's a feeling that social un unease and social unrest are really right there kind of boiling, almost, almost at the boil. In my own personal life, that wasn't the case. I didn't live that close to the street. I was sheltered by living in a different part of the city and by my, my own life as an academic. I wasn't so close to the, the quivering heart of Detroit. I wasn't that close as the characters in my novel, obviously. Mm -hmm. And uh, novelists, I think, are attracted to social unrest, but also to the context that leads to it. So providing the background is what the novelists would probably do rather than just focusing on the action itself. A movie can focus more on just the action, but the novel goes back into the past usually. And it felt to me um, that in the portrayal of the, the older children um, in this novel that you're exposing how flimsy prejudice is as a state of mind that 
prejudice often comes from a place of willful ignorance and misdirected anger. Um, can you speak a bit about prejudice and how ignorance and anger manifests in characters like Beverly and Lorraine and Tom? They're all very anxious and jealous of Hugo because they see him moving into their mother's life and they're totally terrified that she might marry this person and disinherit them. <laughs> it's the sort of thing that adults don't want to think that they would react that way, but they do react that way, you know? The idea that your mother might remarry to many people is so unacceptable a thought, even though you're a perfectly normal, liberal, reasonable person, there's something that sets off panic. So they all become very prejudiced because not all of them, the younger ones are not like that, but Tom and his older sisters, they're talking about this Hispanic person that they, they don't know what he is exactly. They, they're condescending to him. They think he's like the lawn man. He's working on the grounds or something. Some neighbor calls him and says that your mother is out in a canoe with the, lawn, with the lawn man, the man who does the grass, you know. But Hugo wasn't, he was not at all. I mean, Hugo himself was a, a very gifted photographer. And mm. the, the, the prejudices that spring out when people are personally threatened are very, very painful. Mm. I try to see it in a, in a kind of comic way, though, that the older children are reacting in comic ways. Mm. Well, one of them, I, I thought uh, Lorraine was particularly interesting in how she, as the principal of a school, um, reacts to online harassment and um, combats that with some very immoral and devious uh, secret <laughs> retaliations. Um, and um, and I, I know you yourself have been the target of many different levels of harassment for much of your career. Um, what do you think is the best solution for writers and teachers to deal with this? Oh, well, just ignore it. Mm. First of all, anybody, anybody, almost everybody today is vulnerable and attracts some sort of unwanted attention. Mm. Evidently, young women, women, but maybe particularly young women, if they become prominent on Twitter or YouTube, they will immediately attract a whole army of trolls and, and bots and misogynist, horrible people who send them death threats and so forth. I don't think that I've attracted a whole army or contingent because people don't really read books that carefully. People might be annoyed at something on Twitter, but I, I don't think I've ever attracted, you know, millions and millions of, of death threats. But this does happen today, so the best thing is, I think, to ignore it. I'm sure the death threats are just things uh, somebody's typing out, you know, somebody's living in a garage in, in Seattle, and yeah. she thinks she'll scare somebody else. Mm -hmm. uh, I just more or less do ignore it. Mm -hmm. Don't you? I mean, if, I don't know, you probably don't get it much or any negative attention, but all you have to do is just not yeah i've been very shocked actually on on twitter when um i think the um the, the most um negative and and uh and threatening like um responses i've got was when i tweeted once um uh with a what i thought with a fairly benign question um asking why in a sentence is it always ordered he and she rather than she and he um, you yeah. know, that, that's sort of like the, the, the male always comes first. And, yeah. and I got such a huge amount of negative response to that of, of very defensive <laughs> men, um, you know, saying, saying, oh, how can you worry about issues like this when there's such larger issues? And, and who really tried to, you know, just to miss, dismiss it and trivialize it. And so it made me aware how much whenever you bring up any, um, you know, feminist or somewhat feminist issue that, you know, there's this huge backlash of very insecure men, um, isn't there? It's, it's almost, it is really common. My friend, Steve Martin, has sometimes said the most innocuous thing. He's a comedian, he's funny, he's very funny. And you get this barrage of insanely 
stupid response is, you know, it's like the people are just looking for a fight. Somebody wakes up in the morning in a bad mood, goes on to Twitter, finds the tweet by Eric Anderson or Joyce or Steve Martin, and this fires off some crazy thing. Mm. Which in real life, nobody would do. Yeah. One of the first times I was on Twitter, I said something totally, I mean, really innocuous. I had nothing to do with feminist politics or anything. And I just got back such an angry tweet. You are so ugly or something like that. And I thought, what? Oh. <laughs> it was just sort of crazy. Yeah. So I think being, being baptized with that, you just sort of carry on. And then you don't have to see these people. You can block them. Yeah. You can just ignore them. And, and like social media is something you've persisted on and are very active on. Um, so, so what attracts you to um, being active on Twitter and Instagram and, and, and do you find it, do you not find it too much of a distraction sometimes from your, your own writing? <laughs> well, I don't look at Instagram too often. I like Instagram as mainly just visual and it's quite nice, but mm -hmm. I don't do too much with Instagram. However, I, I like it. Mm -hmm. But uh, Twitter, I find very educational. I've learned so much from Twitter. I mean, not to exaggerate it, but I have learned so much about the United States, about regions, mm -hmm. about things that are going on way below the, the radar of mainstream media. Mainstream media had a stranglehold on news in the United States. Mm -hmm. When I grew up in the 1950s, there were three television networks. There were very few publications. They were all white. Everything we saw was white-owned. It was sort of right-wing. I mean, it was somewhat Republican. You could grow up in the United States in the 1950s and until about 1963 and just have a very homogenized, superficial idea of the culture. Mm. Today, through Twitter, you can see a video of some horrific torture death in Minneapolis, video recorded on, on her cell phone by a 17-year-old black girl. Now that's unprecedented in history. Journalism had always been elite. The mainstream media like the New York Times covers a tiny, tiny fraction of the news. We were not seeing anything about Occupy Wall Street. The New York Times had just condescended or ignored that. Bernie Sanders didn't exist for the New York Times for months. Finally, at one point, when he was winning primaries, the New York Times condescended to do an article on him. That's the, the largest mainstream media newspaper there is, the New York Times. And they had totally marginalized and ignored so much. And even now, they ignore a lot. I think Latino readers and Latino culture, I think, is pretty much ignored by, by mainstream media. However, when you go to Twitter, it's a totally different world. Mm. Yeah, and it forces a lot of those conversations yeah. to the, the forefront, doesn't it? Those are individuals, they're different regions of the United States, different mm. economic levels. Some are famous journalists, some are famous comedians like Steve Martin. Mm -hmm. Of Bill Maher. Some are totally unknown people with five followers. And you learn, you just learn so much. I think Walt Whitman would have been so happy with Twitter. <laughs> you know, I am large, I contain multitudes. That's Twitter. Mm. Of course, you have to be careful not to just believe anything because there has to be some standard of uh, you know, plausibility. Yeah. But the uh, Black Lives Matter, I think, would not be possible without social media. Mm, absolutely. Um, and just to get back to the, the novel, um, a very important character I want to talk about um, is called Mac the Knife, um, yes. who is a cat that enters the mother Jeselyn's life when she's grieving as a widow. And he's very imposing and you describe him so vividly um, where he becomes almost magical or sort of supernatural presence in the story. I mean, it reminded me somewhat of the, the cat Mahalil in um, your novel, Belle Fleur, that we talked about earlier. Um, but could you um, speak about your, your inspiration for, for Mac and his importance in the story? Well, I know you're not going to believe this, and nobody would believe this, but 
I created Mac the Knife sort of out of my own imagination because he's a likely kind of tomcat to come out of the woods. Then, four or five months later, now I know people won't believe this, a black tomcat came out of the woods, exactly like Mac the Knife, except he was much nicer. I have lots of pictures of Sheba. At, uh, we called animal control to make sure that this was not a lost, you know, cat from somebody's house. And the animal control woman who came over, she said that was a female, in fact, it was a male. Mm. But anyway, his name was Shiva. He was very happy having a female name. So Shiva stayed for about two or three years, but he was a lovely kitty. He was very, very, very affectionate. He was not like Mac the Knight. And yet what an amazing coincidence that I would create Mac the Knight who of course also suggests that, that Jessalyn is maybe suppressing a part of her own nature and something comes out of the woods. So Hugo will come along and he represents something very different, totally different in her life. And so Mac the Knife and then Shiva coming out of the woods for into the house, I think is very, uh, it's risky to bring this new presence into your life and yet it adds so much happiness. So Mac the Knife turns out to be a, a good kitty ultimately mm -hmm. after he's had his operation. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh yes. <laughs> he, dis he disappears from the novel. I mean, there's not much about him later because mm -hmm. Hugo comes into the novel. Yes, and you, you've told me how um, the character of Hugo um, is, is partly based on your, your second husband, Charlie. And in the novel, I found it very moving how Hugo's eye for taking photographs also allows Jessalyn a new perspective of the world. Um, and as Charlie was also a photographer and you traveled with him extensively, um, how did his photography and art artistic perspective affect you? Well, Charlie was like a force of nature. I'm a very introverted person. I know I'm talking to you at great length. I'm not a person who really talks a lot, mm -hmm. and I tend to be quiet in a group. Well, Charlie came into my life like a whirlwind. It's extremely verbal, Jewish from Brooklyn. And if anybody knows Jewish people from Brooklyn, you know immediately what I'm saying. Extremely interrogative, argumentative, contentious, very verbal, sort of high maintenance male, totally different from me. Yeah, sort of opposite personality type. Opposite personality, but we were linked by many things. He had read my book, he read a lot of my writing, and he, he had read a lot of classic literature. He was a neuroscientist, another very different sort of personality. Hmm. I learned about the personalities of serious scientists, which I had not known about. Hmm. Personalities very different from, from us. Hmm quite different. So he was like a whirlwind. So too with Hugo in Jessalyn's life, she's, she's overwhelmed by him. He's bossy, he's aggressive. He's very tender and sweet and generous, but he is very bossy. And he just sort of, a man like that will take over your life if you allow him. Some people would run away in fear, but if you don't, if you're not afraid of a person like that, it's quite, quite really transforming. Mm. So I found myself, I don't like to travel, really. I found myself, well, as you know, I was in Corsica once mm -hmm. when we ran into each other in that memorable time. Yeah. That's because there was a neuroscience conference in Corsica. I was in Dubrovnik. I was all over Italy and the Melfi Coast. I was in Beijing airport. I was in Bali and Australia and the Galapagos, mm. where, which is where the novel ends. Mm. I went all these exotic places with Charlie and all my friends were astonished. <laughs> Joyce, what? There was some sort of a terrible storm and my friend said, well, you won't be going to wherever it was. And I said, oh yes, Charlie's, we're going. I said, you're going? Shouldn't you cancel the trip? I said, no, 
Charlie says we're going. So <laughs> I found myself doing all sorts of things I would never have done. Mm. And when I look back upon my life for the past uh, 10 or 11 years, it was really a, a whirlwind of adventure. Mm. But Charlie also was working hard. So there was part of the time when he was working on books and he was teaching. Mm. So I had plenty of time to do my own writing. Mm. It was more when he went on his adventures. Mm. When he went to Antarctica and Mongolia and India and China, I didn't go with him. I did not go with him. That's too far. <laughs> no, the Mongolian trip, um, the Antarctica trip, they're hardship trips. Mm. I mean, you really have to be a seasoned traveler. And mm. India, in the monsoon. <laughs> Who would go to India in a monsoon? <laughs> All my friends could just, they could not believe Charlie. He took they such beautiful it. photographs of all these locations as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I was looking at, at some of the, the galleries you, you sent and yeah. They're, 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 they was... thought he would live forever. Now, and as, um, as with some of your previous novels, the title of this new book um, comes from a line of poetry and um, the, the poem by Walt Whitman um, serves as an epigraph at, at the beginning of the, the novel. So um, can I uh, can just read it aloud to you? And uh, yes. A clear midnight. This is thy hour, O soul, thy free flight into the wordless, away from books, away from art, the day erased, the lesson done, thee fully forth emerging, silent, gazing, pondering the themes thou lovest best, night, sleep, death, and the stars. What does that poem mean to you? Well, it's a very beautiful poem. It's my favorite Whitman poem. I mentioned before that I taught a song of myself. Most people know Whitman as very expansive, extremely long lines, just brimming with life and brimming with catalogs and details and all sorts of uh, colorful richness and the variety of life. However, he's really telling us in this poem this is the soul, and this is the, at midnight, away from the world, away from books, away from everything, and just all alone with your soul. And these are the things that he contemplates when he's all alone, his real self, night, sleep, death, the stars. I just think it's so heartbreakingly beautiful. And I think it's really beautiful how the, um, and moving, how you incorporate the message of that poem into the ending of, of the novel. Um, I found the, the final section really very beautiful. Um, well, thank, thank you. It's hard, for, it's hard for me to read any of this. <laughs> it's like the very ending of the Gravedigger's Daughter, those letters. So. But yeah. Some things that I've written about are just hard for me to, it's hard for me to re-experience. Revisit that, yeah. Well, um, thank you so much, Joyce, for, for speaking to me. It's, it's truly been an honor. Um, you're a continuous source of inspiration to me. So thank you for all of your writing and your generosity for speaking to me for so long here. You want to wait for one minute? Should I try to find Zanji? Oh, yes, please do. Okay. Yeah, we'd, uh, we'd love I to see him. You know, cats sometimes can't be found. Might be oh, elusive. She's right, she's right here. So big. <laughs> She's she's big, she's as big as Mac the Knight. Ah yes. <laughs> this is a Maine Coon. Oh ah, yes. A beautiful tail. See, the tail. <laughs> the tail is fantastic, and then she's got these big feet. The the Maine Coon feet. Mm -hmm. There may be some viewers who who understand cats, but okay. <laughs> Yeah, I have I have a friend who has two Maine Coon cats. Oh, so okay. gorgeous! Yeah, they're they're beautiful. I couldn't believe there was a Maine Coon abandoned and probably abused in a rescue, and there was this beautiful kitty I brought home. So for about two weeks, she hid behind a bookcase. She was so terrified, <laughs> but now she's the, she's taken over. She sometimes does my twit tweets. Gets <laughs> me in trouble. She does the Twitter at night. <laughs> And she may start writing your novels now. <laughs> yeah, I wish, I wish she would. Thank you, Eric. Good to meet you. Thank you bye so bye. much, Joyce.